Thank you for the invitation and the possibility to speak about the rise of Hitler and fascism in Germany. I think it's a very important issue, even in the 21st century, even 83 years after the rise of Hitler to power in Germany, it's a key question to understand what's happened in those days in Germany, especially given the fact that uh, Germany was, if you like, a cradle of Marxism. Germany had a very strong labor movement. Germany had the strongest social democratic party uh, at that time. It was, uh, if, if you like, the jewel in the crown of the Second International. Germany had the strongest communist party outside the Soviet Union in those days. And yet, we've seen a crushing defeat uh, of the German labor movement, a capitulation to the fascists, and Hitler, the fascist dictator, prided himself that he had come to power without even one window being smashed, without even any serious resistance being waged against his uh, takeover. So this is really a phenomenon which still has effects today, especially uh, in Germany, and it's our utmost duty to analyze uh, those events, but not only what happened in 1933, but to put the whole question in, 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 into context. There are many superficial explanations. You know, many of us have been to school, history lessons, and uh, they tell us lots of rubbish about why Hitler came to power idealistic rubbish. They tell us in times of, of crisis, the Germans always move to the right. So it's the German soul. Germans like their little Adolfs and so on. It's rubbish. Um, they say there was a collective guilt of the German people, This, especially the ruling class afterwards. said, Well, all, it's, it's a collective guilt of everybody. Every German citizen is guilty of what happened and the the crimes that followed the takeover. This is, of course, a line of whitewash by the ruling class to divert the attention away from their responsibility. Uh, they say it's just because of Hitler's phrase-mongering and rhetorics that uh, he attracted the masses. That, that's the, um, another explanation. And then when I went to school, they said there were deficiencies in the Weimar Constitution. So it's those deficiencies in the uh, chapters of the Constitution that allowed Hitler to come to power legally. Or they even say in Germany there was no GH, uh, G, GCHQ or no MI5 in Germany to stop Hitler in time, <laughs> because now they have sort of MI5. And in Germany they say, now we are careful about extremism to the left and to the right. And that's how they claim they've learned uh, from, from, from history. And there are other theories that say if the Bolsheviks hadn't taken over power in 1970s, Hitler wouldn't have taken over power either. So the Bolsheviks rather shouldn't have uh, you know, fought for power, then everything would have been smooth and we would have a century of social democracy and liberal democracy. All these things you're being told. And, um, but the facts are different. The hard facts, and I'm going to, to go through many more facts in the course of this lead-off, the hard facts are that Hitler never won an absolute majority in a free election. In, I'm talking of free election. The, the, the fact is that the working class, the bulk of the working class was opposed to Hitler. Most resistance against Hitler came from the working class, from the labor movement. And there were about half a million people actively doing some sort of resistance, which was extremely risky, and many take their lives. And there were 250,000 trials in the 1930s against a sort of oppositionists, and most of them were, there were also Jews, there were also some Freemasons, there were, were also some, some Jehovah's Witnesses and some Borgia, but the bulk of the opposition against Hitler came from the labor movement, from the communists, from the social democratic, from trade union and other left organizations. So this, this um, must be made clear you know, to, to defend the honor of the working class. Now it's not true to say that Hitler 
Hitler's uh, victory was inevitable. We are not fatalists about history. There's nothing inevitable. History is is, uh, influenced and made by man, by the living forces, the living class struggle. It depends on the subjective factor, what the outcome of the class struggle is. And therefore, it's important to see, to consider the events of 1933 in the context of uh, the preceding 16 years of revolution, international revolution. You know, we're going to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Russian Revolution next year. And that revolution, the Russian Revolution, ushered in um, an epoch of turmoil, of revolution and counter-revolution, but it was an epoch. If you like, the epoch started in 1917, and the epoch, in a way, ended in 1933. It did and it didn't, because in a way there was uh, events like Cable Street in London that you recently commemorated, there was the Spanish Revolution, but the German defeat, the, 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 the rise of Hitler, in a way was uh, uh, the end, <coughs> first decisive setback for that, uh, for that whole process and you know, marked also a milestone on, on the road to the Second World War. But first of all, in this context of the revolutionary events in uh, Germany and Western Europe, we must say that there was an enormous swing of the pendulum, pendulum towards the left after 1918, in the period of 1918 to 1923. In Germany, uh, one year, about one year after the Russian October Revolution, there was no, the November Revolution, when the old um, empire collapsed, when the emperor, the Kaiser, had to abdicate and went to exile in Holland, when uh, Soviets were founded, workers' councils in 47 industrial areas, you know, strongholds of the working class, there was, in effect, dual power and the uh, possibility of the Soviets taking over power in Germany was within grasp. There were many strikes, you know, general strikes. There was a situation of civil war in Germany. This alone would be a topic for a, a special uh, session, you know, the early stages of the German Revolution. But uh, by and large, the pendulum swung to the left in those days. But the question of leadership then uh, uh, turned out to be decisive. In the first phase of the revolution, the majority of the workers looked towards the old social democracy. It is true that they had betrayed the uh, advanced workers by supporting the war in 1914, but nevertheless, the more backward sections of the working class moved towards social democracy in 1918-1919, which was reflected, for instance, in the election result when uh, they set up the bourgeois state again. They had the the, um, elections in January 1919 for the Weimar Assembly to work out the Constitutional Assembly and there was a a sweeping victory for the Social Democrats. But the Social Democrats, of course, did their utmost to drown the revolution in blood. And there was civil war in Germany, all over Germany, in the industrial centers. Social Democrats allied themselves with the Freikorps, sort of uh, demobilized soldiers, uh, World War I veterans, reactionary troops, that were created again to smash the revolution. And this was uh, an an, an utter crime for the Social Democrats to make a coalition with those uh, Freikorps, because the Freikorps, if you like, were uh, uh, the germ of the later Nazi movement. So so it's true to say that the Social Democrats were the cronies of uh, what what you, you, you know later become Nazi movement. They, they, they had their own vested interests, the social democratic bureaucracy and trade union bureaucracy wanted a bourgeois democracy, but not, not revolution like in Russia. 
So they drowned that in blood in 1919. What's a year of turmoil? You know, the army went around, the troops went around from city to city to smash the uh, councils. Uh, but at the same time, there was an enormous <coughs> radicalization. Uh, the hitherto passive sections of the working class moved into action. There were many local strikes for wages, for better conditions. Um, there was an influx of the, the, the social democratic trade unions. The unions grew within three years from one million to seven million members, an enormous strengthening of the working class. Um, and um, in 1920, another turning point was the Kaputsch. This was an attempt by right-wing reactionary elements within the army and uh, big landlords, mainly, not, not the entire capitalist class, but section of the ruling class, right-wing reactionary uh, socialist fascist element, an attempt to establish a military dictatorship in Germany in March 1920. That was about the time when Hitler's party was founded, but was a small insignificant sect at, at, in, in, in those days, down in Bavaria in Munich. But the Kaputsch, the attempt to establish a military dictatorship, <coughs> led to a spontaneous general strike, uh, which uh, you know, was uh, extremely successful. Within three or four days, the uh, military coup collapsed. And this general strike wasn't organized by anybody. It was spontaneous. No leadership um, called for the general strike. Later on, after a day or two, of course, all the parties, the, the, the SPD, the independent, the left, you know, split, and the tiny Communist Party and the unions, they, of course, then made, made appeals to support the general strike. But initially, the general strike was spontaneous. It was successful. So it shows the whip of the counter-revolution um, uh, meant an enormous impetus for the revolution. And in uh, major industrial areas, like in the Ruhr and in the area around Leipzig and Halle, there was an armed uprising of the workers. The workers did not only want to get rid of the, 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 the right-wing Reichswerk, uh, you know, leaders of the coup, but they formed their own workers' army, the Red Army of the Ruhr. And they, within a few days, they took over power in the Ruhr and kicked out all the reactionary army elements. So this was victory, if you like, in some areas, but not all over Germany. So 1920 was another swing to the left, which was expressed in a swing within the labor movement from the social democrats to the left, split off independent social democrats, the USPD. So in June 1920, uh, the USPD in the uh, parliamentary election got almost as many votes as the SPD. So an enormous power of attraction, you know, enorm enormous radicalization of the working class. Um, and later in 1920, the Communist Party was formed. Again, the Communist Party until 1920 was a mess, absolute mess. It was messier than the hostel where we've been last night. It was an absolute <laughs> disaster, absolute chaos, crisis of leadership. This was a tragedy of the revolution. But then with the help of the Communist International, because at that time uh, Russia, Moscow, was very attractive for the advanced workers. Then uh, at the <coughs> National Conference of the Independent, the USPD, there was a debate whether or not to join the Communist International. And the majority of the delegates uh, voted in favor of joining the Communist International. <coughs> so from the end of 1920, we had two strong labor movement parties, two, two workers' parties, major workers' parties. That's uh, the, still the old social democracy, which still had a base, especially of trade unionists, and the Communist Party, which was growing and thriving. And, you know, this is also an, an expression of a shift uh, to, to the left. But at the same time, we see, you know, 1920 shows the ruling class at that time did not yet, you know, try, try to play the trump of fascism, of dictatorship. They, they knew it was too early. They learned that without 
They learn from the Kapuch. Without a mass movement, an organized mass movement, you cannot just establish a military dictatorship and suppress a working class which is in uproar and which is being radicalized. This is what they historically learned then, 10 years later, when they, when they supported the fascists. But, you know, at the same time, it must be said, you know, with the revolution 1918, the capitalists made concessions to the working class. The capitalists are prepared to make any concessions so long as they are allowed to keep their property and their privileges. So, so they conceded uh, women's suffrage, they conceded uh, eight-hour day social reforms, you know, many, many progressive reforms, of course, but... Uh, the demand of the advanced workers was the nationalization of industry, of the commanding heights of the economy. And then they played dirty tricks, and then they said, you know, the bureaucrats said, no, we're not going to nationalize, it's too early, the workers are not ripe, you know. The workers must, first of all, learn to, to run industry, so we're going to have this system of industrial democracy and co-determination, and we're going to set up a commission about it. So what they did is take the question of nationalization off the agenda. The fact is that in 1920, you know, we had, as I said, the establishment of the Communist Party. Um, in 1921 and 22, there was a speeding up of inflation. And this culminated in the year of 1923, when, um, you know, in, there was hyperinflation in Germany. It made life impossible. There was uh, low unemployment because the German capitalists benefited from, from uh, inflation, you know, with an offensive of exports, but, you know, you couldn't buy even a slice of bread for uh, billions or trillions of, 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 of marks. You got, you know, paper money. So 1923 marks another historic chance for the working class to take power. This was culminated in summer 1923 when there was a general strike against um, the reactionary government of Kuno, you know, a reactionary industrialist who was the chancellor, and he was hated. This general strike brought down the reactionary government, but then there was no perspective. And the, the tragedy in those days of the Communist Party was that uh, the Communist Party leadership didn't know what to do with this revolutionary situation. But there are many indications, I could give you many examples, there are many indications that in, in those months, in the summer of 1923, there was a sharp shift within the working class from the Social Democrats to the Communists. In some partial elections, in some union shop stewards elections and other indications, we can see from, from, from the facts that... Um, that, you know, increasingly workers who are, un, until then had been loyal towards <coughs> social democracy and trade unionists were looking towards the Communist Party for a solution. The crisis, however, you know, passed by. The Communist Party didn't act. Uh, th this is a story in and of itself, also a separate story. We could discuss the question of the, the early Communist Party in Germany. But anyway, having said this, the main thing is uh, that what I'm saying is from 1918 to 1923, we had several revolutionary opportunities. We didn't have a strong fascist movement at that, at that time. There were reactionary elements in the state and in the army and so on, but not a fascist mass movement that could have smashed the working class in, in, in those days. And the opportunity was lost. This is a fact. Then after 1923, we had a certain stabilization. Stabilization of the economy, of the political system, a stabilization of reformism. And also, we, you've got to see the, the fact that the revolutionary opportunity was missed in 1923. Trotsky wrote an article about it, and he also considered Germany to be the key. Uh, this fact then... A few months later, uh, Lenin's death led to the crystallization of the, you know, it, it, it gave an impetus to the crystallization of the Stalinist bureaucracy, the theory of socialism in one country, and uh, the fact that the Communist International 
increasingly became a tool of the Stalinist bureaucracy. And then from 1925, the leaders of the Communist Party in Germany were just obedient, uh, obedient, uh, if you like, bureaucrats who would uh, carry out any, any, any party line, any change of the party line that was imposed upon them from uh, Moscow. So this is another fact which we should keep in mind for, you know, when we, we are going to discuss uh, the question of um, the mistakes of the Communist Party in a few minutes. The fact is that the Golden Twenties, as they say, the Golden Twenties, 1924 to 29, when there was a certain boom, a certain stabilization of the currency, a certain stabilization of the economy, it's true that then again, the unions uh, could fight for some reforms. There were some wage increases and, you know, some, some minor improvement. But uh, there was always a, a certain level of unemployment. In, I, I got many statistics here. You can, I can send them by, by email. There was always a certain level of unemployment. Those 19, and there was always an intensification of labor, you know, squeezing of, of the working class. There was a rationalization in industry. Those years were not so so golden, but you know it was for the working class. It was a, a relative stability, which led to a stabilization of social democracy. Again, social democracy. Then, in the in, in the second half of the 1920s, was the strongest. You know, the stronger of the two workers' parties. Although the Communist Party, at 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 uh, you know for for a while, also had quite some influence uh, within the trade union movement. Now, in those years, the, the Nazi party was, you know, the Hitler's party, the NSDAP, was a relatively, you know, small party. Um, didn't play a major role, uh, you know, two or three percent in the elections, mainly based in Bavaria, but Hitler, you know, the personality of Hitler, Kept, uh, kept, kept the whole thing together. And it's true to say that in, in those days, uh, the ruling class, the bulk of the ruling class didn't really like Hitler. I mean, he, he was a strange guy anyway, and they didn't see, see him as a useful role. They had their traditional parties, their traditional bourgeois parties. Uh, there was a variety of, of different bourgeois parties in those days. There was also a center party which had Catholic unions. You know, in those days we also had Catholic labor movement, not only social democratic labor movement in Germany. But still, uh, Hitler, war, you know, had, had a cozy life. There were always some rich backers, some rich sponsors for the fascists, you know, in, in, in the 1920s who supported them. But it wasn't the, the commanding heights of the economy. But there were always some reactionary capitalists who kept the Nazi party alive. But then things changed rapidly in Germany with the beginning of the world economic crisis in 1929, 1930, you know, Black Friday. And uh, Germany is, was especially hit hard by the crisis. You find all the explanations in uh, the works by Trotsky, and I would, would recommend comrades read Trotsky on Germany, because those were fantastic analyses. Uh, keeping in mind that Trotsky was far away in Turkey most of his time in the early 30s. He had no Facebook, no internet, no fax machine, no mobile phone, no, no modern means of communication. Uh, and he got the, the journals and the leaflets and from his comrades got them with, with a delay of days, weeks and months. But on the basis of the material he got, he wrote a brilliant analysis and understood, you know, the changes in the economy and politics and the psychology of the different classes of society. So it's really brilliant stuff that he wrote. Once again, the world economic crisis did not only lead to the impoverishment of the working class, you know, unemployment, unemployment went up, I've got the statistics here, in 1930, 22%, 1931, 34%, 1932, 44%. So, uh, and if you, if, if you consider that, you know, all those statistics do not always reflect the truth, and there was a section of workers who had only part-time work, who were reduced to part-time work forcibly, then the majority had no, no, no decent jobs. Starvation, 
soup kitchens, poverty, misery, did not only affect the working class, but also the middle classes. And in, in those days, uh, there was um, a stronger element of petty bourgeois uh, you know, layers in society. There was the peasantry, uh, which was about a third of the population. There were small businessmen, artisans. The, there were all sorts of uh, you know, middle classes that were also affected by the crisis. And that also still, uh, you know, long back to, to the good old days of the German Empire before the First World War. Uh, so th those middle classes who in 1923 could have been won over by the, by the labor movement. And there were signs that the middle classes would have supported the Communist Party if they had made a proper revolutionary offensive in, in, in the summer of, of 1923. So the middle classes, once again, in their despair, in their demoralization, looked around for a solution, for a radical and non-establishment solution. And when they looked around, what did they see? Well, first of all, uh, social democracy, which uh, was the party, if you like, of the establishment, because social democrats were those who had sort of brought about and ushered in and, you know, born the republic. And they were the, the, the most fervent supporters of the republic, of the bourgeois republic, and they thought the bourgeois republic would solve all the problems and, get, and, 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 and defend them. So you had the social democrats who were in, 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 in government from leading the government from 1928 to 1930s. Then you had the Communist Party, but the Communist Party by 1928-29 had changed its line, you know, the third period of uh, the Stalinist uh, International, the Communist International, which meant that they thought this was the final crisis of capitalism. So as a, a bit of mechanism, sort of, this is the final crisis of capitalism. It's, capitalism is finished, it will never rise again, which is, uh, of course, a wrong assessment because Lenin always said capitalism will always find a way out, find a way out unless it's consciously overthrown. So you had the Communist Party with this theory of final crisis of capitalism and the theory of social fascism. And this was absolutely, you know, uh, fatal. They had this Stalinist theory. Uh, they said anything to the right of the Communist Party is fascist. Different brands of fascism. So it's a final crisis. Capitalism is doomed anyway. So the, the masses will just go through different regimes of fascism. So social fascism is social democrats. Clerical fascism is the Christian democrats. And uh, Hitler fascism is also just another brand of fascism, they said. Uh, so just let the workers uh, go through the experience and then we will be in power. Then, then we as communists will be inevitably in power. This, just, you know, put it bluntly, this was the essence of uh, their theory. And, you know, I think Stalin himself or one of his theoreticians said... Uh, Social democracy and fascism are just twins, you know, twin brothers. It's also a wrong theory, of course. Uh, the social democratic bureaucracy saved capitalism, this is true, and they made this alliance with the reactionary soldiers in 1980-1990, but uh, it's absolutely wrong to, to denounce social democracy as a brand of fascism. Social democracy they want to have a cozy life on the basis of a bourgeois republic. Liberal capitalism play a role as parliamentarians with the, with the apparatuses and so on. But uh, they are also mortal enemies of the fascists. The fascists themselves, for them, all the labor um, movement was Marxist. They said, they, they called them all Marxist. They didn't see many differences between social democrats and communists and other tiny parts. They said they're Marxists, they're Bolsheviks. And, and the fascists said, we're going to smash them. So this was a mistake, you know, not only a wrong theory, but in fact it led to a split of the labor movement, a split of uh, communist and, and social democratic party, and a split of the living forces 
that could have united, should have united in a united front, as Trotsky pointed out, should have united to stop the fascists, irrespective of, of um, political differences. Social Democrats still had a majority of, of, of workers, and in fact, because of their uh, ultra-leftism, the communist workers were good class fighters. They were the first to be to lose their jobs in the crisis of 29-30. They were the first to lose their jobs, but because of their ultra-leftism, ultra there wasn't much of a willingness of the social democratic workers to defend them. So they, the Communist Party in the early 30s was the party of the unemployed. And you know, you know people who have been unemployed for a year, two, three or, ma or more years, they get very desperate. They're, st they're hungry, they're starving, they get desperate. And sometimes they can also get very ultra-left, impatient. And, you know, this was the material basis for also for this ultra-left theory, which then deepened the split uh, between the workers' parties. Now, consider, you know, those uh, millions of petty bourgeois elements who were also affected by the crisis, when they looked at the labor movement and saw this mass of opportunist social democrats and ultra-left Stalinists and the split and, you know, labor movement fighting each other. Of course, the labor movement didn't appeal to those petty bourgeois sections. And here comes the factor of the Nazi party then. Um, you know, Hitler's party was called the NSDAP, the Nationalsozialistische Deutsche Arbeiterpartei. So it contains the word socialist and the word worker. And, you know, there was always a sort of left wing of the fascists who believed in sort of national socialism, also had some anti-capitalist phrase mongering in their original program. They didn't, uh, never took it seriously, but they, they had this. And they, even nowadays, when you, when you, when you meet fascist groups, some, some of the more, if you like, Hitlerite fascist groups, nowadays in Europe also uh, use this sort of uh, anti-capitalist phrase mongering. So this was an element of, of the Nazi party. The Nazi party then turned out to be the only non-establishment party, which hadn't been, you know, in the regional government or in national government. And they said, we want a revolution and fight the privileges of the bosses and things like that, phrase mongering. So, so uh, they attracted those demoralized uh, middle class elements. Not, not a party, as Trotsky said, not the party of revolutionary hope, but the party of, party of counter-revolutionary despair. So this is what happened. In 29, for a, for a moment of time, the labor movement, if it had been united, could have attracted those, those millions, but they didn't. They, they missed the train, they missed the opportunity, and then you had the fact that in the elections... In the early elections to the Reichstag, the national parliament, in 1930, the Nazi party went up from 3% to 18%. So they, they turned out to be, you know, to jump into a position of being the, the second strongest party in the country. But where did the votes come from? Not from the labor movement. Labor movement, the SPD and the KPD always had... Uh, between them and, and, and earlier, the independent USPD always had a, a reservoir of 12 to 14 million votes that was solid working class vote. And that all remained more or less until 1933. The basis, the, 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 the voters of the Nazi party mainly came from small bourgeois parties. Uh, the German Nationalists and German People's Party, Peasants' Party, Agrarian Party, you know, all sorts of petty regional parties, they were more or less, uh, they were squeezed out and they were sort of left aside. So this is uh, where uh, the, the Nazis got their, 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 their support from, more, more so in Protestant areas than Catholic areas. But nevertheless, then the question was, fascism was there, and it wasn't only 120 MPs of, of, of Hitler's uh, gangs with their brown shirts in the parliament, but it was a mass movement. And this is uh, the difference between fascism and any other, if you like, reactionary regime. Fascism, as Trotsky said, you know, to 
when we ask ourselves, and, and you asked the question in, in the beginning, what is fascism? Fascism is not just a system of repression, violence, and police terror. Fascism is a special system of state based on the elimination of all elements of proletarian democracy in bourgeois society. So the task of fascism is not only the uh, smashing, the elimination of the proletarian vanguard, but to uh, keep uh, the uh, entire labor movement in a permanent state of fragmentation. Um, Trotsky says this requires not only the physical elimination of the most revolutionary layers of, of the working class, but to smash and destroy all the independent and voluntary organization that the proletariat has built for over 70, 80 years, you know. 70, 80 years of labor history we had. Uh, now we, we have 150th anniversary of many unions and, you know, the, the labor movement in Germany. So all this history was supposed to be eliminated by fascism. Trotsky also said fascism is distilled imperialism because if fascism takes over, fascism uh, destroys the labor movement. This is a major precondition for, uh, you know, moving towards the Second World War. So this was the historic task of fascism. Um, and this means that it's not enough to, to have a government with uh, some civil servants, a police, and uh, the repressive state apparatus. But what, what the fascist movement had was an, an army of hundreds of thousands of armed petty bourgeois and lampen proletarians, you know, the stormtroopers, the SASS volunteers, whom they recruited. Out of those, you know, elements uh, were despaired about, were desperate about uh, the, 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 the crisis and, and their own uh, personal and uh, uh, pol uh, their own uh, social, you know, loss of social status. Voluntary army, armed, armed men in uniforms, and they were the battering ram. They were the battering ram to smash the labor movement. And... It was a mass movement, so they had their spies in every in every block, in every village, in every factory, in every in every town. So this was the difference between fascism and uh, ordinary um, ordinary system of repression. How much left? Uh, you've got another fifteen minutes. If fifteen. You okay. So it was clear. Trotsky said there were also other good, you know, good, good writers, but Trotsky was by far the best. He warned that if fascism comes to power, then it's not just another kaputsch or so on, then it will be a showdown with the, with the working class. But it didn't happen immediately in 1930. But first of all, the question is, what was the, the, the reaction of the labor movement, the, the labor leaders? Uh, in, in, because you must see in Germany between 1930 and 1933 there was again a state of civil war. There were permanent clashes, violent demonstrations, attacks, killings and so on. And uh, in, 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 in almost every uh, you know, individ individual case the state was always on the side of the right wing state organs. You know, the Republican state was basically the same state bureaucracy as under the old Kaiser regime, nothing had changed, so they always defended the fascists. The, the problem is the, the labor leaders were, uh, were helpless, especially the reformist leaders. Uh, the leader of the trade unions, ADGB, ADGB, Leipzig, in end, the end of 1932, you know, there were, before Hitler came to power, there were Bonapartist regimes. There were different regimes of Brüning, Papen, Schleicher that, um, you know, reacted as Bonapartist uh, governments without parliamentary control on, on, on the base of emergency law. They just, on the base of decree, without any, any parliamentary influence, the, the, those regimes. And uh, Schleicher was the last one before Hitler. And the, in, in the end of 1932, Leipzig, the, 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 the TUC leader in Germany, he thought he approached Schleicher and, uh, and, and, and asked him, what about uh, us joining your government? 
we thought, you know, we go to peace, Schleicher, join a government, get some of the trade union demands fulfilled. At that time, again, because of the ultra-leftism of the Communist Party, there was a left wing developing in social democracy, even a left split, a centrist split, which, you know, Willy Brandt and so on, young, young socialists uh, joined. They left the SPD, looked look towards Marxism. Uh, and those young, young uh, members in social democracy who wanted to take up arms and fight the fascists were expelled by the social democratic leaders because party leaders said, we can only fight the fascists on, on, legal, on legal grounds, you know, and not, not, not with illegal means. And taking up arms would, uh, would um, um, provoke, you know, state resistance. We, we accept the monopoly of arms of the bourgeois state, all these things. So we, we fight on the basis of the constitution. If we take up uh, arms, then it means civil war, and we don't want civil war, we want peace. And, you know, this, this sort of, I think, was also echoed at the TOC conference. Alan always quoted Walter Citrine in the 1933 uh, TOC conference in, in London, when uh, the left wing said we should do something about fascism also in Britain, and Citrine said, no, if, if they had taken up arms in Germany, it would have meant civil war, and we don't want civil war. Uh, the fact is, it would have meant civil war, but there would have been a good chance to win the civil war. But the way they, they were defeated was the worst, the worst possible option of any defeat. It was even worse than the defeat in in Spain, where there was a civil war and they won, historically it's better for the morale of the working class to commemorate the history of civil war and fighting. And even, even, even if you lose, in Germany there was no fight and they lost and it's demoralizing and still having some effect today. And, you know, mind you, when Hitler, I'm just uh, going to tell in a minute, when Hitler came to power in 1933, the social democratic leaders thought that they could save their skin and their parliamentary uh, existence and their um, apparatus by disaffiliating <coughs> from the Second International. <laughs> this is, you know, how, how far the... the and, and they even expelled Jewish members of social democracy from the party to try to appease Hitler and said they, they were also good nationalists <coughs> and so on. Uh, I've spoken about the mistakes of the Communist Party. The problem of the Communist Party was that they set up their own unions, the, you know, they, they own split off unions, the RGO, so the Communist workers had no chance to approach the Social Democratic workers in the unions and win them for United Fronts. There were some smaller industrial towns where there was some United Front. I think they, they, they were towns where the left opposition had a, a stronghold, was expelled from the Communist Party, but nevertheless, they carried out a policy of popular front that was partially successful, but of course, in the end, then they were also smashed by, by the fascist takeover. So, anyway, Hitler, you know, increasingly turned towards the ruling class. He was the strong man, you know, the, the, the decisive player in the game, uh, uh, turned towards the ruling class. In 1932, the fascists had 37% of the votes cast. That was their peak. But another early election in November 32, they lost 2 million again. So it shows they were beginning to crumble again. Because you cannot keep a fascist movement on the base of, of phrase mongering together. Trotsky said, human dust cannot keep that together forever. Labor movement has. Uh, higher cohesion than any fascist reactionary movement. So, end of 1932, the ruling class increasingly discovered the virtues of appointing Hitler as chancellor because Hitler said, Whoa, no, no, sirs, you know, put on a nice suit, went to see the big bankers, von Schröder, uh, Reusch, Thyssenkrupp, Vögler, and the others, you know, the, the leading, the leading uh, managers of, of, of uh, heavy industry. He met them. And he told them, well, don't, don't, don't worry about our socialist program. We're not going to carry out our program. <laughs> we do what you want. So increasingly, at that time, the industrialists saw it was about time to get Hitler into power, because otherwise maybe the movement would have crumbled. Uh, there was another upswing, you know. 
beginning to, to be felt, which would have been, you know, reduced unemployment, would have given the working class more strength to fight again and so on. So it was about time and that's why they precipitated in um, 1933 to um, take over, to, to, to push Hitler into power initially in the coalition. But of course, immediately Hitler then uh, began to, 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 to purge, you know, uh, the state apparatus began to, uh, first of all, um, put uh, leading communists into, into jail and, and persecute them. And also a shameful aspect of history, the, the trade union leaders in April 1933, you know, Hitler, because he knew that he didn't have a, 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 a sound basis in the big industry, in the core of the working class. So he said, let's make May Day, 1st of May, a national holiday, national bank holiday. It's shameful that the Weimar Republic didn't make May Day a public holiday. They should have done it, so Hitler did it. And then the ADGB, the, the trade union <coughs> leader, said, we call on, upon our members to go to the official May Day rallies by the Nazis on the 1st of May, 1933. They thought, again, this would save their skin. But, again, um, on the 2nd of May, the Nazis took over the Union buildings, you know, and uh, dissolved the unions. This is, shows how thankful they were. And then the whole thing started, and, uh, you know, all the bourgeois parties, uh, except Social Democrats, goes to their credits that they voted against it, but all the bourgeois parties voted in favor of giving Hitler all the power he wanted in a special enabling act in Parliament and dissolved themselves. Dissolved themselves, basically. So dictatorship was really consolidated then. But once again, I got many statistics here, and we, in the course of the discussion, and maybe in the sum up, I can also, uh, you know, mention some some other questions, some consequences and lessons of, of, of uh, fasc the history of fascism. Uh, the Nazis were not a workers' party, as I said before. You know, I got here the statistics of how many civil servants, uh, freelancers, uh, white-collar workers, farmers and workers were members of the Nazi party, you know, in relation and the smallest share was of, of the workers, you know. Shows uh, what's mainly civil servants. Of course, civil servants, they, civil servants are always very flexible. <coughs> People in a nice position in civil servant, they would change their party cards easily, and this is what happened, you know, in, in Germany too. And there are many examples, you know, of um, the Nazis tried to hold um, council elections, shop stewards elections, uh, in 1933, 34, 35, and there was still resistance to those elections uh, in many big factories uh, still up until 1935, uh, where a majority in 1934, there was one election on 20th of January in 34, where um, in those factories, you know, they, they, didn't, they didn't admit it publicly. It was a shame for the Nazis, but up were well, 75, three quarters of the workers who cast their votes in those so-called uh, council elections in the factories, 35%, three quarters voted no or abstained. So they didn't vote for the official so-called Nazi shop stewards. So it shows that there was always some resistance. But of course then um, immediately, uh, you know, the leaders were... Um, were arrested, were put into prison. There were first casualties. First of them were murdered, even in March, uh, April, and, and, and May 19, 1933. And uh, the consolidation, you know, of, of the dictatorship began. And, uh, yeah, many more figures, but I'm coming to the end now. Of course, this was not a paradise for the workers, but there was intensification of labors and... Uh, there was a bonanza of profits, you know, profits of Krupp, major, you know, steelworks and arms uh, industrialist Krupp. It rose from 6.6 .6 to 21 uh, million Reichsmark over the 1930s, you know, after Hitler had taken over. And the overall <coughs> profits 
of industry and commerce rose from 6.6 .6 to 15 billion Reichsmarks on the basis of the intensification of labor. And wherever there were some strikes, like at Opel, at General Motors, or at, uh, in the ruined big factories, they were blood, brutally oppressed. You know, intensive, I, I got many more figures, I leave it, but you, you know, it's the same thing everywhere. And uh, anyway, this is full of lessons, but I'm, I'm, I, I just want to stress one point again. It wasn't a matter of course. It wasn't, you know, obvious that Hitler would come to power. It was a question of uh, revolution and counter-revolution. Pendulum first went very far to the left, and because it wasn't solved, because the workers' movement didn't take over power, in the end, they left a vacuum for the Nazi party to move in and take power. And uh, we must see this in, 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 in this context, obvious, obviously, um, because when we say 1917 was the biggest event in the last century, we must also see 1933 in Germany was the biggest defeat in the last century, and there's a connection between the two. It still has effects. Uh, fascism uh, doesn't play the same role now as, as then, but still it's a warning. It's a warning what happens if you don't uh, bring down capitalism. It shows, you know, uh, what, what barbarism, what sort of barbarism can come up again uh, if we don't, uh, if our generation is not uh, in a position to bring down capitalism, overthrow capitalism, and um, build a socialist world. Thank you.